<laughs> so we're going to pass this off between us. Um, this is our TBD talk because we have a sort of different position than a lot of you is we're trying to figure out how to use a lot of this stuff. And um, so as Matt likes to put on things, he puts random things on the slides. So we're going to give our impromptu speech that I'm going to switch in and out of PowerPoint because for various reasons. Um, one of the things I wanted to go through. It's a lost sign. What? Okay. There's a lost and a very lost sign on the slides. <laughs> um, one of the things I wanted to go through, because I think there's quite a few people here who don't know what MITRE is, and some other people who left who didn't know what it was, was just a, very quickly about what MITRE is. Um, so MITRE oper operates what are called federally funded research and development centers. We're a system engineering company. We act as the trusted advisor of the government. So in that role, um, we don't compete for regular government contracts. The only contracts we have with the government are these long-term FFRDC contracts. And that allows us to give unbiased advice, and um, even when there's contracting and things involved. So if they want to know what they should buy or what an optimal portfolio is across various sorts of things, we can help them with that sort of thing, because we're never going to be one of the people bidding on one of those contracts. Um, we've been around since 1958, coming out of uh, MIT, starting doing radar stuff. And these days, we actually operate seven FFRDCs in a wide variety of different range, um, areas ranging from the DOD and um, the security area to the FAA. We do a bunch of work for CMS and HHS on healthcare. We do a bunch of work for the IRS and for the VA about how that, that works. Um, our newer things, we have some judiciary work and we have a cybersecurity FFRDC. One of the interesting things about MITRE from our perspective, and probably why the three people in this room are actually still at MITRE after coming here, is one of the things MITRE does is written into all our, all our contracts is a s small percentage of them is reinvested in an internally funded innovation program where we write um, grant proposals to MITRE for us to do research work. Um, and uh, Sanit, who's going to speak, runs one of those portfolios, um, but that allows us to do a bunch of research work, sometimes very experimental, a lot of times very aligned with what our sponsors need. And actually, we're hosting this event on a little tiny research project that I'm the PI and Matt's the co-PI on that we called strategy mining, which I'll talk a little bit about what that means. But um, it's this tiny little seedling project of us trying to figure out um, in this sort of inverse uh, generative social science area, what's there and how would this help our sponsors? So with that, I'm just going to um, hand it over to Santa because he has to leave. Um, and let him speak for a bit. Yeah, so I think it's kind of interesting to give the welcome to Midas speech at the end of the conference here. Um, but perhaps it's not so inconsistent with a conference that's inverse generative social science. So <laughs> you, probably, you probably all inferred this already, so it's probably redundant. But um, anyway, uh, what was I going to say? So. Uh, My innovation program is our internal R&D program. It runs in parallel. Uh, with our direct work, and um, it's I ideally aligned to the outcomes of our sponsors. But sometimes those outcomes might differ, um, and in particular, uh, an area that we're very excited to pursue on our research program is climate change. So I know that was a topic that came up a couple of times, uh, maybe uh, over the last few days. Um, but as you know, this is kind of the problem of that is really resisting any real major um, kind of improvement. If you look at any of the forecasts out there, it's almost like we're pretty much done and why, why bother? But um, there's some interesting work uh, that we'd like to start looking at and in the context here of market designs. So market design is a term that uh, Alvin Roth came up with, uh, Nobel Prize winner economics for his work on kidney exchange markets. Uh, but some of you might say that it is the failure of the market that is kind of contributing to our current state. Future cost in climate or social degradation isn't priced in. And so it has this runaway effect that's unbounded and we're now stuck with where, where we're at. Um, a couple of areas we want to try to investigate further is uh, climate resiliency and insurance markets. So if you've heard of, um, well, you probably saw 
uh, all the wildfires in, Calif in uh, Australia, prior to that the wildfires in California, resulted in insurers dropping the insurances of around 200,000 homeowners insurance in fire prone risk areas. Um, so how would you redesign that insurance market to change kind of the cost benefit structure given that current, current insurance markets are based on actuarial projections that rely on certain statistical patterns to hold in the future? Um, in California, we was reported that over from the 2017 to 2018 year, insurers there lost all the money they've raised in the last 25 years. So their models clearly are collapsing. Uh, as they collapse, the reinsurance markets are also now having to rethink how do they price premiums. Um, so there's a real supply demand dynamic there that needs to be restructured. Um, we are trying to look at it from that kind of behavioral uh, economics perspective, the game theory perspective, an optimization approach, um, whatever we can try to do to understand that dynamic uh, with the end goal being given our position in the federal government, we are able to start to present that as options uh, to folks when they finally realize this, you know, they can run away from it. Um, so that's one area of our research right now that's beginning. Um, it's moving forward in multiple different directions. There's a might of research portfolio specific to aviation and transportation. Um, as you know, that's a large fraction of uh, contributions to global warming there. Uh, there is a health innovation area that's looking at the social determinants of health um, and how we might look at health insurance as it pertains to these types of changes. Um, the innovation area I lead is agile government and we are spread over many different um, of our public sector agencies. Um, and right now we are not getting that signal as, uh, oh my God, we need to help address this problem but we anticipate that it will happen eventually and it's uh, our job to try to provide options. So um, as Matt and uh, David said, um, our research program is independent in the sense that we are allowed to move in many different directions without having a whole lot of constraints. Uh, we do partner with universities and have partnered here with some of you in the past. Um, looking forward to seeing what comes up and um, I know this is going to be a question uh, later in the afternoon on how we move forward. Uh, but I, what I'll throw out is um, take advantage of engaging with us um, and uh, connecting to our own internal teams as well as you explore some of these topics. So with that, I will hand it right back. Um, so I'm going to talk about data, but not solutions to having data. I just want to talk about various data things and potential uh, areas of data where we might have challenge, uh, do challenges around this because that was one of the things that Bill wanted to, we wanted to talk about today. Um, and I wanted to start with a sort of a toy question of uh, going back to, you know, net logo and things of um, this is sort of where Matt and I sort of started with our idea of strategy mining and things is imagine we're not looking at this. Imagine we're looking at those out there um, and that and we have drones and UAVs and they're they are autonomous and they're all working and let's say we can watch them for a certain amount of time. Can we um, determine the rules they're making for how they're moving and then potentially do things to make them change their rules? Um, and that's, a, that's sort of how we got started in this whole area was that question of, you know, uh, starting with a bunch of data, really raw data about what's going on and trying to infer the strategies and the rules that individuals are using, you know. And that's a toy model, of course, but uh, you know this is not. You know, so this is a DARPA project where they're going with a bunch of autonomous vehicles and going and trying to complete an object. Um, go, um, I started at the wrong place, but um, you know, ground and ground and air vehicles working autonomously, trying to accomplish some goal. Now, my interest isn't really about trying to accomplish that goal. It's more that if I'm watching this and I want to then disrupt this in some way, can I do that by trying to look at the decision, the decision making, trying to infer the decision making rules that these autonomous agents are working on? That's sort of the inverse problem that we've sort of been thinking about. You know, 
because there's a lot of sort of this forward AI and deep learning and these other sorts of things. Um, you know, and it's sort of interesting. Matt Santh and I have been talking about this for five years, actually. Um, going back to something we were doing related to cybersecurity in 2015. So um, probably most of you are familiar with, you know, the deep reinforcement learning and open AI. You know, so open AI over four years with this video game called Dota 2 um, got good enough at this five versus five um, competitive cooperative game in order to beat some of the best people at this game that play this game for $15 million prizes. So they, you know, built these models in order to do this. And that, that's all really interesting. Our perspective was that that's all really cool from, from one hat. To me, the sort of more interesting thing is this is a sandbox filled with data. You know, here's a bunch of information about the game that won the team on the left $15 million. Um, here's a bunch of aggregate data about this. Every game that this is played is logged. And not only can you get this out from, from the playing of these games, you know, you can get this out. Here's everything that happened over the entire game at every tick. Um, so the question, and the interesting thing about this particular game is the strategic decision making is happening at the micro scale and the macro scale. They're making decisions between games about how to play. They're making micro level decisions within the game about what to do. And all of that's being played out in this sandbox where we literally know every button they push exactly where their camera is. Um, so we were interested in this because um, we were doing some work on some cybersecurity work with some bot games and we were trying to figure out how do we determine when, they're, when the bots are changing their strategies and who's winning at these sorts of games. So we actually sent one of our MITRE people out to SFI over the summer. Um, they did this little study where they ended up doing just some hidden Markov model work, you know, trying to look at this sort of uh, co-evolution of strategic decision making, trying to pull out decision making information from this high fidelity data. And we got a little bit down this path and then uh, the interest in it disappeared. And then OpenAI came out about a year and a half later and got everybody interested in video games. So we were a little bit early in doing this particular thing. But I just wanted to sort of point out that, you know, here's this laboratory of, you know, real people making decisions for millions of dollars where we know micro data about everything that's going on. Um, you know, another one of these things that I think is interesting you know, is, um, is the Reddit place experiment. So if you're not familiar with this, um, in 2017, every year Reddit does some April Fool's Day thing. In 2017, they put out this canvas of a million pixels, thousand by thousand, and told users, you can change one of those pixels every f five to 20 minutes. Um, for 72 hours, there were over a million pixels placed, and you know, here's what happened. Um, this is the beginning of this. Um, it's a four minute video, so I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but you know, so we've got up to a million different people where some of them are bots all interacting, all with different goals in mind. Some want to make it blue, some want to draw things, some want to destroy things. If I skip this randomly forward, um, you end up in these states like this. So you know, you've got a set of N people trying to draw the Mona Lisa, a set of N people trying to draw the German flag. At one point you've got a set of uh, the German flag trying to invade uh, France, the France flag right here. <laughs> and again, what's interesting with this is um, Reddit put out all of the data. So you know exactly every time, you know what user changed what pixel at every time over the entire experiment. So you could, you could try to say, okay, well, what is the strategy that the Germans are trying to use to draw their flag? Is that the same strategy as somebody else? Um, you could probably fairly simply um, figure out who's a bot and who's not a bot, but maybe the bots are using different strategies. But you know, if we're thinking about a challenge and having these like large scale data, of, again, inferring from the data the strategies to then perhaps do the simulation part, which I sort of skipped, you know, there, there are these large scale sets of data out there. And you know, from our perspective, these are interesting as toy problems. We tried to do the Dota 2 thing because at the time we didn't have a lot of cyber data and I was really interested in it, and I convinced Stan if it was interesting, and he convinced his boss that it was interesting. But just to turn stuff back to being real, um, I guess some people in the room helped get this passed, but um, you know, in, in 2018, um, Congress passed the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, uh, which basically said all of the agencies should really do a better job of getting all their data together and then use it to make decisions. 
but it didn't really tell them how to make decisions. And now we're sort of getting asked, well, now what do we do? I don't know, Sam, if you want to speak about that. No, I, I was going to say it's kind of telling to have such a thing in a statute, and it begs the question, what the heck was going on before that, right? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it is a step in the right direction. It doesn't apply to the legislative branch, uh, which I think is where this should best be applied, but it does apply to all executive agencies. So what it says is all U.S. agencies need to report to the Office of Management, Management and Budget every year their top research questions, the data they're going to use to analyze those questions, the methods, the analytics, and basically use that to drive their policymaking functions, which is, you know, it, it's created this uh, two additional positions in every agency, a chief data officer and a chief statistical officer. They're the ones who have to carry this conversation forward and are accountable on it. Um, but it's a great kind of opportunity for us to kind of anchor into some of their policy making activities because now this is the law. It's not just an option to drive policy. This, this is the approach to do it. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, we have lots of, you know, different agencies have lots of different data, lots of different granularity of data. You know, VA knows every time a, a veteran goes to a clinic, they know all of that information. They could be using that to make decisions. You know, um, you know, the SEC has their MIDAS program, which is basically essentially full ticker data about um, the 12, 12 markets. I'm going to say their number wrong, but you know the best bid and best ask at every moment in the day at every time. Um, and they're going to try to use that in order to look at the stability and a bunch of different questions about how the financial markets work. You know, so this idea of having lots and lots of micro-level data and trying to look at either what the agents are doing or um, just trying to make decisions from this, trying to ground this back into some of the theory-based and not just, you know, the black box ideas. Um, you know, and we did a little bit of work on something about using that same sort of data. I just want to plug because it just got published. But um, so we did some work uh, looking at crossing of the market using micro-level data because of latency issues in the financial markets and showed that that happens a lot, which was kind of this interesting result um, that isn't really all about um, the micro-level behaviors, but this was just sort of the first thing that was done in this space, um, and I just wanted to call that out because I think it's cool. And now I'm going to pass it off to Matt, who's going to talk about some more concrete things. Thank you. Um, and actually, a lot of this turns out will be uh, repetitive because uh, Rob <coughs> and Bill <laughs> talked about a lot of this already. So we'll go pretty quickly through here. Um, and these are slides pulled from, from something else, but there, there's a particular point I want to try to make here. Um, obviously, I, I don't need to convince folks here that models are useful. Um, and one of the ways that we've been trying to use them, you know, we do this prototyping business, then we figure out what the actual question is and how we can approach it with a model and a simulation specifically, then we, you know, port it to something robust, we run it on lots of different computers and things, and generate a whole ton of data. And the, the whole point here was that there should be some region that's, that isn't surprising, that we expect to see and that we know is right. There should be some region in here that we expect is wrong, you know, so essentially we're breaking the model so we know how it fails. And the idea there is that we've mapped out all this space, and then there's this, some other chunk in here that's <laughs> unexpected. And the hope is that you've gone through enough uh, process, which we'll talk about in a second, so that this is, can be considered insight as opposed to a bug. And that can be kind of tricky. What works? That works. Okay. Um, so assuming all this is useful, you know, no, this is also coming from our perspective where we're trying to help the federal government solve problems and do applied science. Um, so, okay, so it's useful and it's interesting and it's fun and it was neat to do, but it somehow needs to be fitted into a decision support framework so that folks can actually use it to make decisions about policies or what to do next, how many of these, this or that to buy, that sort of thing. And so, we have to be able to make meaningful statements about how these things relate to the real world. And that's right, we already heard about that. 
verification, validation, and accreditation. So did you build the model correctly? Did you, you know, did you build the correct model? And can we trust it in this particular situation to make this particular decision? And you know, so the verification part is, I think, going to get tricky with, with uh, inverse generative social science. Because typically, the way this is done, at least you know, in our experience, if you start with a detailed formulation, you, you have a narrative that explains what's going to happen in this model, why, what it's based on, and all that jazz. And so it's that rich narrative, and then you can you know, map that narrative to your code. We've, we've literally taken every sentence in a 25-page formulation, put it in a table, and then actually cut and pasted the code that implements that sentence or made some statement as to why there is no code that you know, with that sentence. That was horrible. I don't recommend it. But it is conceivable. And so that's how you can verify it. But that's going to get tough if we start growing these things because they're not starting from that formulation. They're starting from data, and then we're allowing some sort of algorithm to come up with the rules. Now, validating these things is essentially trying to say, is there some sort of referent that's meaningful in this space, and your model can, you know, represents that somehow. And the way we've found to do this, because, you know, sometimes that can be a little tricky, is by combining right, the, the empirical validity that we heard about uh, yesterday with, with another uh, concept, docking, where you're comparing the output from two different models. Uh, identity, the two models produce literally the exact same numbers, distributional, the two models produce different numbers, but they're statistically indistinguishable. And then relational, the two models produce statistically distinguishable outputs, but when you refund one lever and you refund the same lever in the other model, they move in qualitatively the same way. So putting these together, this is really annoying. <laughs> okay. So typically, or at least you know, canonically, docking was model to model. Um, but you know, you can, it, it's not a big reach to go say model to referent and then just, okay, well, referent to real world. And, and so now, essentially, we can start to map those two things together and then try to push that towards how you're going to use the simulation. And you can use that to figure out how rigorous your process has to be. And by rigorous, I mean expensive. So, you know, again, Strictly speaking, we're systems engineers, not that I've ever taken a systems engineering class, uh, but I can't spell S-E. Um, so we've got, you know, the empirical relevance here, you know, qualitative micro, qualitative macro, quantitative macro, quantitative micro, relational, distributional identity, but then, you know, sort of the, the important part here, at least for us, is how we or the sponsor want to use it. Is it just as a thought experiment, just trying to get their arms around the problem? just trying to do some basic, you know, kind of, could this possibly be the right generating mechanism? Or even trying to do some sort of, you know, coarse or fine-grained forecasting. And, and this date and time thing, you know, less, obviously, you can spend a lot less time trying to figure this stuff out and a lot more down here. Uh, that was just the PC way of saying money when you try to explain this to a sponsor. And so <clears throat> that's kind of fun, and, and that, that's worked out really well for us. And it also gives us a nice way of explaining to folks, you know, we have, you know, as, as David said, and, and, you know, we've talked about for the last three days, we have, I mean, data, in many ways, data is not a problem anymore. And so certainly when it comes to physics, we, we get that. And so that, that could be, you know, super high resolution stuff. But the social things might be, you know, level zero. I mean, we might have some sense of how people do it, but we might not know exactly how, right? And that's, of course, why we're all here, trying to figure that out. So one example of how we try to put this together. Um, so uh, the, anyway, our, our country has these things called national planning scenarios. And number 12 is a coordinated suicide bombing attack at a large sporting venue when there's some sort of event going on, which was actually subject to some debate. <laughs> then uh, the nearest transportation hub, and then the nearest hospital. And so uh, DHS basically said, look, we've, we've got a bunch of sensors. We've got some cops that'll be around. 
and then we've got this venue, and we want to prevent the bombers from getting in. And we said, okay, well, that's easy. You just lock the doors. Um, and they said, well, no, but there's an event going on. People want to get in. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Hot dogs need to be eaten. So, uh, so then we actually had to, had to uh, you know, discuss what that meant. That means you're never going to prevent all of them from getting out or getting in. But so what we want to do here was maximize the probability of detection. And so now we had our figure of merit. And now what they wanted to do was say, you know, okay, we can't have lots of sensors and we can't pat everyone down. So let's try to, given that we can afford this quantity of sensors and we can have this many police, what con ops or concept of operations can the police employ and how can we position the sensors to maximize our probability of detection? And so we did the usual thing. We built a net logo model <laughs> to start prototyping this thing, get a sense of what's going on. And the nice thing is, you know, with, with extensions, thank you very much, um, we, could, we had super high resolution down to the photon representation of the sensors and how it would go through fabric and that kind of thing, bounce off different materials underneath the fabric and stuff. So once we got a sense of, okay, the geometry, how we were going to set things up. Also, by the way, we did have one very interesting insight. Um, one potential solution is to have a whole lot of bombers. Because part of their decision you know, criteria was if I can't get into the venue, then just blow myself up. And at one point we were debugging it, so we cranked up the number of bombers, and they all got jammed in around the turnstiles here, panicked, and blew each other up. <laughs> so, but that, DHS wasn't super thrilled about that option. So uh, we, we put it into repast. But the nice thing is, because of the extensions and all that, they could use all the same physics engines. That made the, the transition pretty simple. You know, ran the bejesus out of it, used a genetic algorithm to optimize locations of things. And it was interesting. I mean, we found a couple of basins where you know, it always worked better if sensor B was in front. It didn't really matter what else happened around it. It was always better if sensor B was in front. And then, uh, actually, oddly, uh, we actually convinced DHS to do some human-in-the-loop validation here. And so we went up to a, a mid-level hockey venue in Tacoma and actually ran some human experiments with uh, fake bombs and, and all that jazz. And it, you know, that worked out really quite well. But it's not totally clear. Once, once we start growing these things, this is, is going to be a little different, I think. And it's going to be tricky to figure out where these things fit and when it's going to be right to use one or not the other, and especially trying to understand if you've overfit. Because particularly, you know, a lot of our sponsors, they're asking us questions not because they want to understand the current state, although there's definitely some confusion about that, but they want to perturb the system somehow. And now suddenly we start getting out of sample and the data gets to be very sparse. And so uh, one thing that at least I'm still wrestling with with this whole uh, IGSS is how we try to make meaningful statements about their utility and how they can plug into some sort of a decision-making framework um, as we move forward, especially you know, that parts of the government have decades of experience using analytics and simulations for making decisions. Um, and so that you know, good and bad, they're comfortable with the idea of doing it. Bad in the sense they also have a whole lot of baggage and assumptions about all that, because typically that grew out of physics. And so, you know, is this a good simulation of parabolic flight? I don't know, let's go out in the field and shoot something and see if we got it right. And if we didn't, we just need to add more detail. And of course, as we all know, just adding more detail doesn't necessarily work in these circumstances. It works fine if you're worried about physics, but it's not necessarily helpful here. Um, let's see, okay, that was your part. Yeah. And now, oh, one other, <coughs> ta-da, one other um, piece of open source uh, software that MITRE created recently that might be of interest to folks um, is this synthetic uh, patient data generator. And so basically, you know, everyone's sort of paranoid about making PII and health records available, except apparently to Amazon, didn't, didn't someone just make or Amazon buy a ton of data lately? No, that article is junk. Oh, good. <laughs> I was a little surprised, to be honest. 
Um, and so to try to get around that, because of course there are lots of analyses that would be nice to be able to do with patient records, uh, MITRE's over the last five years, I think, uh, put together a fairly detailed uh, simulator or, or Pachenko machine um, to create synthetic populations of patient records. And so it, it's essentially just a state machine and, and you've got initial conditions and things like that and you just sort of turn the crank and you end up with longitudinal patient records. But what could be pretty interesting, oh, and there's lots of stuff in there like urinary tract infections and lupus and, oh wait, the, actually the one interesting number I hadn't seen before, apparently there are 60,000 ways a human body can fail. That, that was news to me. I hadn't seen that number before. Um, There's got to be more than that. Yeah, yeah I would. <laughs> so, but it would be kind of fun because essentially, I, at least I like to think about this as sort of a biased Pachenko machine. And so you, you sort of dump the potential patients up and they jiggle around and depending on where they went, they end up down here with some sort of longitudinal health problems. But we know exactly what created all of it. So it would be interesting to see if we could use some sort of IGSS methods to essentially reverse engineer this population so that we can get a sense of how their health status might change over time well, and also their behavior on seeking health care. Well, and, and I'll just say that, you know, th this whole method is kind of inverse generative social science. They built a bunch of trees about how diseases, different diseases progressed and looked <laughs> using real data they had access to, tried to generate a population that fit the real data in some way. Um, and whether they did that in a really good way or not, it wasn't kind of their goal. You know, the other piece of this is, you know, the, the real goal of this was to generate healthcare records that look like real healthcare records in the FHIR format, so that if you were going to go and do analytics on healthcare data, this gives you data that looks like the real data, so you can design your algorithms to run on real data because otherwise there's no way to get access to that unless you're running Epic or one of these EHR systems. So like for people to do analytics on these sorts of health records, there's no other data. So even if the data is wrong, which the data of course is wrong, we, they've tried to, they, Matt's part of they, but I'm not. So they've tried to make it as right as they, they could using the methods they had, but the fact that it exists in that format could be interesting to this sort of crowd. Just, just FYI, and that's where you can get it. If, if, if you're curious. <clears throat> and, and that includes like, right, they have a, a simulate, basically a simulation of the state of Massachusetts over N years. Yeah, and they also have a bunch of data that they've already generated. Yeah, so there's large data sets that are completely public of patients over time. And one fun thing, we, we have also managed now to wrap it up in a GA. Well, oh, so another miter, uh, we should have put that on there too. Uh, the, the, this is, what, sorry. so I'm paranoid about making good acronyms and I had nothing to do with this one. Um, the MEG, which stands for the MITRE Elastic Goal-Directed Simulation Framework. Um, and so it, it's essentially a just... That's a really bad movie. Yeah. yeah. I actually haven't seen the movie yet. <laughs> and I meant it's not a short movie. Um, it's, it's basically a bunch of optimization techniques, GAs, heuristic search stuff uh, that tries to be simulation agnostic and can work on most all of the cluster computers and things out there. And so we wrapped Cynthia uh, up in that. And so now one thing you can do with this is to say, I want a population that has these kinds of statistics in its healthcare records. And then you can just run this thing for a while and it'll eventually generate something similar to that. Um, okay, and I believe, yeah, kind of, oh yeah, the cat videos, we already showed those. And, oh, and you already talked. Oh, all right, we just reversed the, okay, we're done. Yay, questions, thoughts, concerns, comments, and, and welcome to MITRE. Oh, and one other thing, thanks to Steve Scott, there are a few cookies and some candy in the other room. Sophia is a trait intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Somehow we ended up monopolizing all of our minds. <laughs> So when I think of building something like Cynthia, I think of taking real data and running it through a generative adversarial network so I can build a big multivariate distribution. So what sort of dimensionality does Cynthia have? It's pretty extraordinary. It's, um, I, I don't know specifically. Do you remember? Um, so what do you mean by dimensionality? How many input variables are there in oh, every record yeah. so or something? I just want to be clear about that. The Cynthia is a, actually a collection of Java 
relies on uh, uh, what are called Java, Java property files. Not Sorry, I'm not talking loud enough. Is that better? I was in radio in college, too. Maybe you can tell. Well, to you 88.5 on your FM dial. Um, so back to Synthea. Synthea is a collection of Java program, Java code. And uh, the Java code relies on these properties files, which are ASCII readable files. And each file contains the name of a, um, a transition and then the probability between 0 and 1 of that probability happening. So if you have, as Matt alluded to, he showed, showed a chart very quickly where you had like I think uh, 20 or so top diseases or something like that. What that would be represented is, is a Markov model of those disease transitions for uh, a given, you know, uh, a, a, a normal person. So here's, here's a list of, uh, say, for, for example. So uh, like diabetes is a good number three. So what you'd have there is what's the probability of transitioning from healthy state into diabetes stage one, diabetes stage two, diabetes and so forth. And that's all calculated out in advance. And it's represented as a properties file, which is the name of the transition and then that probability that you have. So that's, that number, number three would be one of the, the uh, Markov models, but then there's, as you can see, there's 10 listed there, but I think there's up to 40 or 50 or so different diseases and conditions that can be modeled this way. So what Matt kind of uh, quickly alluded to in the GA discussion was that if you treat that uh, set of properties files variables as a gene, you can easily tweak that in a genetic algorithm. And so we had swarms of, uh, of Synthea modules running, 50 of them running. Each of them had their own properties file. And you just tabulate those against your, your known population. The best, say, 10 are then used for the next generation, and the bottom 40 are, are uh, discarded in a traditional gen genetic algorithm fashion. So that curve that Matt showed where they're converging, what that's actually showing is the random start and then it's converging to the desired population distribution of conditions and distributions in about 50 generations or so. But again, it's all open sourced and uh, available to model these things. And they try to do it modularly so that um, each of these diseases would just be represented as a separate Markov model. Okay, so I, I think it you know, has a certain applicability to the work that's going on here. So thanks for the question. Very helpful. And I'll just also add, there's some folks working on use, trying to use GANs to generate synthetic waveforms and imagery to add to this, trying to make it like a bigger multimodal data, data set. You know, using some of the, we have access to various healthcare data from some of our projects, so trying to use some of that to, you know, add some imaging and waveform data Sorry. to it. So are the variables, are they independent or are they, is there comorbidity there? So that's a great question. I think we can wrap that up in what's called comorbidity. For example, heart disease and, and uh, diabetes may occur more frequently together than separately. The current implementation of Synthea, they're, they're independent. They do not have comorbidities in, in, uh, done. We had, well, there are a couple, and we tried to work on some of this with the research project that Matt and I were on, but uh, just because of the limited funding and time, we didn't really solve that, crack that nut. But, but it is a, a known issue that we want to try to, to deal with because certainly in the real world, comorbidity is a, a very important aspect of disease treatment and, and recognition. So, yeah, great question. Questions? Other questions? All right, here you go, Rob. Thanks, Stephen. So, uh, one of you guys, maybe David, you showed the uh, drone, drone motion and, and the question was how to back calculate what the rules were, then could you intervene? Uh, now, I have a little a slightly uh, untoward question vis-a-vis -vis MITRE on this. Okay, so he, he, here, here's how it goes. It goes, uh, five or six years ago, there was a, a world-class uh, agent-based model uh, woman who is a, her actual appointment was the Chinese Academy of Sciences, okay? And she gave several talks at, at agent meetings about how you might control a crowd with applications to, you know, Tiananmen Square, for example. And she actually gave demos of shiv agents that were placed by the government to modify crowd behavior in ways the government wanted. And then she disappeared. We haven't seen her since, okay? Uh, so to what extent can we count on the great work you guys are doing at MITRE being uh, in the public domain as opposed to being used behind a, a firewall? Just want to say it on, on, on. Don't want to go on record saying that. <laughs> yeah. I'll let that answer that. That's a hard our, question. Our motto is is solving problems for a safer world, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that 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 is a. They actually made that up. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a good question in general, and something that we probably do need to give some significant thought to. Is I mean, if if we really do start making progress on these sorts of things. Um, Sorry, there's an upside-down squirrel on the wall outside. But anyway, um, 
if we really start making progress on these things, I mean, it's it's not always what unicorns and fairy tales. It, it, Rainbows. It could important. be it could be something else. You know, by the same token, as as we heard before, as you know, if if we have a more savvy public, there are ways of of being more resistant to that sort of thing also. Um, but yeah, it's always a danger. And I'll just say that I think that there's a sim. Um, it reminds me of the adversarial attacks on um, neural networks, you know, the adversarial patches and all of that sort of stuff. And I guess if, you know, we're not trying to help the government understand these sorts of things, somebody else is. So it's important either way. Your example was a good example of that, that our adversaries are doing that. So we need to understand these sorts of things and what's possible, you know. I showed that in there, there's both, there's, a variety of ways you could be concerned about that, whether they're your drones or somebody else's drones, about the robustness of these sorts of things. You know, there's a whole question of, especially when you get into any sorts of these deep learning models, there's tons of interest in just using deep reinforcement learning to go do things and then letting it go and do that. But there's very little understanding of when you get out of a sandbox that you can control, um, how well that's gonna work. I mean, even if you think about self-driving cars, they're sort of in a sandbox anyway. Roads are pretty well defined. The problems they have are, the problems you read about in the news are when things end up in their sandbox that they don't expect. But the, there's a lot of hype around where these things are gonna lead us. And I think robustness, I mean, adversarial attacks are all about robustness of those sorts of things, which isn't what this meeting's about, but it's another thing that I'm interested in. So I'll probably leave it at that before I talk about that for five minutes. Questions? Thank you. Great.